the hair of the twist problem, and these are much like on the bottom of the You want to start by finding the zeros of the numerator and denominator, and then seeing what that tells you about the graph. In the case of this graph, then uh, you know the zeros of the numerator and denominator if you interpret the graph, and you could come up uh, with a reasonable formula, hopefully a complete formula for f of x, although a complete formula would be a little bit of a challenge. Okay. Okay, so for this function, well, let's just say that this is well, x plus 12 over x minus 4 times x plus 7. Then you can say the five is using the y intercept. And that occurs when y is 0 plus 12 over 0 minus 4 times 0 plus 7, which is negative 12 over 28, which of course reduces to negative 4 over negative 3. So we already have a point in the graph. You can say that we have a point zero negative three seven. Now the numerator zero. Plus 12 equals 0. Point negative 12 zeros on the graph. Because, of course, when the numerator is 0, doesn't matter what the denominator is, as long as it is a zero on the multiple, you're going to get twice a zero, and that's going to give you an x intercept. I'm not explaining this in quite as much detail as I have previously, so you might, if you're not understanding parts of this, you might want to look back at what was done previously. Um, so there we have it. And we'll look at that last one. Okay. The denominator is zero. X minus four is zero, or X plus seven equals zero. So That virtual asymptotes at x equals four and x equals negative seven. Because of course, you solve this equation, you get x equals four. Solve this equation, you get x equals negative seven. That makes the denominator zero, which makes the denominator really tiny, and the numerator isn't really tiny when x is close to negative four or close to four or close to negative seven. Okay. So you're dividing this number by a really tiny number, which gives you a really big result, which makes the thing either go up very rapidly or down very rapidly, or up very rapidly on one side, down very rapidly on the other. Okay. So I'm just okay. get it right that time either. Okay, so anyhow. Uh, so at x equals four, well, here's a line at x equals four. And the line x equals negative seven might be about here. 
Okay. Now the long run behavior. As X approaches negative infinity. Y approaches zero because essentially X plus 12 would be a really big number, right? And so will X minus four and X plus seven. And all these numbers will be really big and about equal to each other. Because a really big number for X uh, isn't much affected by a 12 or a negative four or seven. Okay, so we have a big number divided by a big number times a big number, and all the big numbers are about equal. Well, that's going to give you something close to zero, isn't it? Because this big number divided by this big number is pretty close to one, and you still got to divide by this. So it's like one over a really big number. So you're going to get a really big number, but if X is a really big negative number, you have a negative over a negative times a negative, that's going to be negative. You got three negatives. So I'll say Y goes to zero. Three negative values. Any Y has got to come up from way down go through here and then be asymptotic to this line, which means that that would be this source line. Okay, well then, oh, and that's completely wrong. That without thinking, if y is going to approach zero as you go to negative infinity, it's not going to be a big negative number. Okay, that'll be the case in the other one, which is kind of what I was thinking about. Though. But it's going to come down through zero here, and it's going to stay negative because if y is less than negative 12, this is negative, this is negative, and this is negative. They're all negative, and as x gets really big in the negative direction, it's going to approach zero. So it's going to come down here and it's going to dip down a little bit. Then it's going to come up and approach the x-axis. Three negative values. Okay. As x goes to positive infinity, Y goes to zero because same argument, X is really big, divided then by equally, really, nearly equally big number. And by that equally big number again, it's gonna give you something very close to zero. Okay, Y goes to zero. The positive value. So we're going to approach zero here, but on the upper side of the x axis, on the positive side. <clears throat> now you got a vertical asymptote here, so it's got to come up from values close to zero and then approach the asymptote. And it can't go through the x axis because the only way it can go through the x axis is for y equals zero, which only occurs when y equals negative 12, when x equals negative 12. And now between here and here, well, you have asymptotes here and here, these two lines, and you got to go through this point. Okay. And the only way that's going to happen, and you can't go through the x axis. So you know you don't start the asymptote up here and come down. You got to start the asymptote down here. Otherwise, you'd have to go through the x axis, right? And you can't. 
You basically start way down here and you come up to here and then you end up going way down here. Like this. And I kind of have to break the line here, but you get the idea. So it's going to look like this. Now notice the questions we ask. Bunch of numerator zero, bunch of denominator zero. We interpret those results. It's easy to find the zeros of the numerator and denominator from the things factor. Um, and what happens near infinity and what's the y intercept? What happens? And what happens for big negative numbers? What happens for big positive numbers? We will call it long run behavior. Other authors call it end behavior. Okay. And I'm sure there are other names out there. Those are two that are the most frequent. Okay, well, that's it. So there's a graph of this function. Now, Function. Turns out the way I set it up is just the reciprocal of that function. So, There'd be no surprise since the numerator here is a denominator here, the denominator here is a numerator here, that your y intercept is going to be the reciprocal of the y intercept that you got over here. Now that won't generally happen, so I've written it out. But with this function, that will not be related to that one, but I figured I'd make it a little easier on you. Because now you can easily say what the numerator. The zeros of the numerator are, they're going to be four and negative seven. Same as the zeros for the denominator over here, just to make it easier. Okay. But you can really work through it. So zeros there and there. So We can sketch the information that we have at this point. With x equals four, so we've got the point four zero. When x is negative seven, well, y is again zero. We have the point negative seven zero, and when x is zero, that gives you the y-intercept at negative seven first. So we have the point. Zero, negative seven, first. Now the denominator is zero when x equals negative 12. And the numerator is not zero when x is negative 12. So we know that this is going to get really tiny as x gets close to negative 12. And this is going to not change a whole lot real close to x equals negative 12. It's not going to be zero. So we know that at negative 12, see, let me relabel my negative, or at, at, sorry, at x equals negative 12, let's label this. Here, so it's not in the way of this vertical line, x equals negative 12. We know this is going to be a vertical intersect. So what's left? You have to do the long run behavior, right? So as x goes to infinity, well, you have a really big number times a really big number over a really big number. 
So this really big number divided by this one is pretty much one. And this leaves you still a really big number. So X is going to approach a really big number. Okay. Now, And if X approaches plus infinity, you're going to have positive numbers for all of these. As soon as X gets bigger than four, these are all going to be positive. So it's going to go up. Now, another thing that I'll just notice, the degree of the numerator is one greater than the degree of the denominator. So you're going to have a slight asymptote. have determined what that plan asymptote is. We're going to go on though. As x approaches negative infinity, well, we have three negatives. That's going to make it negative. And these are all going to be really big negative numbers. So this big negative number divided by this one is going to give you pretty much one. And this is still going to give you a big negative number. If x goes to negative infinity, y goes to negative infinity, but I'm all approaching a flat asymptote. So now we have to determine the slant asymptote. So we're going to go, uh, you know, we're going to have a slant asymptote like this. The graph is going to approach that slant asymptote. Um, Something here, the dot goes through here. That line went through the equal sign. This is x equals negative 12. It's going to be asymptotic to the slant asymptote, but then it's going to approach this minus an asymptote. Okay. And over here, again, it's going to approach the slant asymptote. Uh, it's not going to have an asymptote over here, just one over here. So let's see how it works. With a slant asymptote. So first of all, y equals x minus four, x plus seven over x plus twelve. Now we kind of need to expand. This is x squared plus three x minus twenty-eight over x plus twelve. We divide x plus 12 into x squared plus 3x minus 28. And we're going to get x here. And x times x plus 12 is going to get x squared plus 12x. And we're going to make a little note. We're going to subtract these numbers. We're going to get negative 9x minus 28. And that's going to then have, see, it's a negative 9 because negative 9 times x is going to match up this minus x. Negative 9 times 12 is negative 108. And then make a little note that we're going to actually then subtract this, which means we're going to add uh, 9x to negative 9x, which is going to give us 0. And 108 to negative 28, which is going to give us 80. So here's your remainder. This is going to be plus 80 over x plus 12. Okay. Now you can understand 
what we've done here, if you really want to understand the details of this, but here's the process. If you multiply this by this, you're going to get this. Okay, if you multiply x by x, you're going to get x squared. If you multiply x by negative 9, you're going to get negative 9x. If you multiply x plus 12 by this, you're going to get 80. Um, And if you multiply the 12 by x, you're going to get 12x, and the negative 9x and 12x will add up to 3x. Multiply this through here, you're going to get 80. Uh, you have a negative 108 from this. In other words, if just using distributive law to multiply this by this, it's going to give you this note. Check out. I'm going to write it out. So you can always do that, and you probably should. Um, okay. So, this tells us that our slant asymptote is the line x equals negative nine, x minus nine equals zero. That y equals x minus nine. Okay. It means slant asymptote has a slope of one. It goes through y equals negative nine. So let's just say this is like negative two and a third, so negative nine might be here. And we have a slope of one, which means we go through zero nine up here. Nine zero, sorry. And then we can draw our graph. I'm trying to see how to draw the graph because I don't get enough. So, okay, it's going to work. Okay, now over here, we're going to approach this line, which is way down here now. So it's a little difficult to draw that. Uh, but it's going to come up from that line. Um, By the time x is going to do this, so it's going to come up that line. So I'm like this, and I turn around, and go back down here. I'm going to do something like this. Where this is going to approach this line somewhere down below, what we're saying. Over here, we're going to approach. So we're going to. Approach this line as an asymptote, we've got to go through this point, this point, and this point, which means that the line's going to have to come down from above to go through this point. It can't come down from below because it would come up through this point and then it wouldn't be able to get back down below the x axis. Okay, it can't go through the x axis again until it gets here, so it's not going to go through this point. It's going to go through. The x axis only here and here, and it's going to go through this point and be asymptotic here. The only choice is for it to do something like this. Okay. And then it's just going to become asymptotic to this line. And that's what our graph is going to look like. Okay. Now we want to write a formula for this function. Okay, well, we can identify our asymptotes. Okay. They're going to be at x equals negative 2 and x equals 6. They're right here smiling at us. And we can identify our x intercepts negative 4, 0, and 4, 0.
where does include the pleasure denominator includes factors x plus two and x minus six. And then Yeah, zero is at negative four and plus four, your numerator has to include and x minus four. And when I say include, but what I really could say if I had room to write it is numerator has these as factors. These are factors of the numerator. These are factors of the denominator. That's what I mean by include. Okay. Continuing this. So why is there going to be some multiple that I'll call A, which I believe that's what your text uses, multiplied by x minus 4 times x plus 4 over x times minus two, right? So plus two, minus six. But that can't be all of it. And now we have the A out here because we could have any number out here and would have these zeros and would have these asymptotes. Whatever A is, the numerator is still going to have zeros at negative four and four, right? The denominator still have zeros at two and negative six. The other thing that we could possibly have is some polynomial. Yeah, Polynomial won't have any zeros because we've already got our zeros. And also because when the points go through the x axis, it's temporarily very close to a straight line, which means that we only have first powers of x minus four and x plus four. And we don't have a multiplicity on these. If we did, then it might go through the x-axis like a cube function, like kind of like this, but it doesn't do that. Okay. And the graph doesn't have factors of multiplicity too. Numerator doesn't have factors of multiplicity too. Just if it did, then the uh, graph would be touching the x-axis and turning around instead of just going straight through. You've got to understand the multiplicity a little bit to do this, and it's worth understanding that. Okay, well, in any case, this is what we have. Okay. Now, the reason I think we do have a polynomial with no zeros is the end behavior, which goes to infinity on both sides. So we need. of that since if we didn't have p of x the end behavior would be that as x gets really big as x approaches infinity or negative infinity y would approach one we got a big number times a big number divided by a big number times a big number 
that's good. If, if all the big numbers are about the same, which would be the case here, if you just have an X in front, then all those big numbers are about the same. And when you divide the big times the big by the big times the big, you're going to get one. Now, when you're multiplying by A, that means that your actual uh, limit would be A instead of one, but that doesn't change the fact that you'd have a horizontal asymptote if you didn't have a P of X over there. So we need P of X since A times X minus four times X plus four over X plus two times X minus six approaches one plus or minus infinity. The graph doesn't do this. Oh. Possible P of X might be X squared plus one. That doesn't have zeros because x squared can't be negative one. X squared can't be negative. There are many other possibilities for P of X. I just chose a simple one. X squared plus one certainly can't be zero because we said that P of X could be a polynomial that's not equal to zero, okay? Now, if it is, then it actually doesn't work because x squared goes to plus infinity at both ends, okay? And this x minus, you know, this, this part goes to plus one. I can say that, you know, however, the end behavior wouldn't be right. Um, well, this reasoning is getting a little bit heavy and abstract, okay? You've seen it in your In your homework. So at this point, we're just going to say, yeah, we keep reasoning, we get there. Um, but most of your examples are going to be a little stupid on this. Um, and of course, we have to evaluate A. We know to do that. Once we get our P of X, if we plug in zero, we have to get negative 10. And that gives us an equation we can solve for A. Okay, well, I'm not going to go any further with this, but we need to move on. I'm out of board space. And I don't want to take a lot more time on this. Exactly. I'm not. Okay, again, 
If f of x is this simple rational function, what's f inverse of x? And you know that the inverse function is the one that switches x and y. Remember we did the graphs at the very beginning to get inverse functions, we just flip the two columns. That switches x and y, so you can take, you can express this function as y equals x plus two over x minus seven, and then switch the x is the y. The y becomes x, the x's become y. It's all for y. Okay. Use standard algebraic techniques. See if you can solve that for y, and then I'll show you. Okay. So we want the inverse of this function. We do this, and now we solve for y. How do you solve this for y? We've got x equals y plus two over y minus seven. When you have a denominator in an equation, you multiply both sides by the denominator. So you get x times y minus seven equals y plus two over y minus seven times y minus seven. Over here, I'll write it as y minus seven over one, just to be sure we understand it's a fraction, right? So then we can get This. In other words, if you multiply the numerators, multiply by the denominators, the numerator is going to be y plus 2 times y minus 7, right? Over here, if you multiply the numerators, multiply by the and multiply the denominators, your numerator is going to be y plus 2 times y minus 7. So this has the same numerator as this one does, right? And they have the same denominator. Denominator is y minus 7, denominator is y minus 7. But y minus seven over y minus seven is one, so this gives you y plus two. I don't like cancellation because a lot of people just cancel out the y's and say, there's no y, nothing to solve for them. <laughs> okay. And I, I believe that I, I, I see stuff like that way too often. Okay. Uh, so using the distributive law, you get xy minus seven x equals. Y plus two. Now you're trying to solve for y, right? You got a y over here and you've got a y over here. What are you going to do about that? Well, subtract y from both sides. I'm going to skip a step here. I'll put three dots here. You can complete the step. You got xy minus y minus seven x equals two. We're getting closer to being able to solve for y. Let's finish that. Okay, just writing it down again. Okay. Well, we've got a couple of things on this side that we don't want. We've got an x here and we've got a negative seven x here. Nothing we can do about this x right away, but we can add seven x to both sides and then we'll deal with whatever happens with this x, okay? So add seven x to both sides, that gives us x, y, minus y equals seven x plus two. And I got some dots here, we added seven x to both sides. Now, how are you gonna isolate y? I'm sorry, I, I got, we got somebody telling me I did something wrong, which wouldn't surprise me. Okay, I've had a question. Somebody had a plus on this y, and that's no big deal. If you can do the steps for the plus, you can do them for the minus. Okay. So anyhow, this, this is what you've got. So what are we going to do about this? Well, this is where people tend to really get stuck. We're going to factor y out of this. This is y times x minus one. Clearly, the distributive law tells you that y times x minus 1 is y times x, which is the same as x, y. And y times negative 1 is negative y, right? So you just do the factoring. It's a pretty simple factoring, but it's not something that's going to automatically occur to everybody at this point. 
You're going to look at that and you're going to say, well, I can't subtract x from both sides. I can't divide both sides by x because that's going to screw things up. Okay? So what you have to do is you have to factor out the y. And then you can just say, okay, then y times x minus 1 over x minus 1 equals 7x plus 2 over x minus 1. So the y the two dots there, y equals 7x plus 2 over x minus 1. So your inverse function Seven x plus two over x minus one. We want to check to see if this is an inverse. that each function undoes the other. In other words, if you apply f to f inverse of x, it's the same as f inverse applied to f of x. Well, what's f of f inverse of x? f of x is x plus two over x minus seven. So f applied to f inverse of x is f inverse. of x plus p over f inverse of x minus seven. Okay. And of course, f inverse of x is seven x plus two over x minus one. This is seven x plus two over x minus one. Of two divided by f inverse of x minus seven, which is seven x plus two over x minus one minus seven. Now, it's the reason we did complex fractions. Here's one. Okay, and if you understood complex fractions, I'm not going to write out all the details of this, partly because I don't have room, partly because if you don't understand this, you need to go back and review complex fractions so you can do this. Putting the numerator over the common denominator x minus one, we have this step. I'm not going to read it to you. We just multiply the two by x minus one over x minus one to get this. And we multiply the seven by x minus one over x minus one to get this. And you should include that step. This gives us seven x plus two plus two x minus two. Minus one divided by seven x plus two minus seven x plus seven over x minus one. Simplifying, we get nine x over x minus one divided by no x plus nine over x minus one. So this is And no way I've got 
enough room to finish this. Um, we get 9x over x minus 1 times x minus 1 over 9. And of course, 9x divided by 9 is just x, and x minus 1 divided by x minus 1 is just 1, and we get x. Okay, now I'm going to write that out somewhere. So just starting with this step. Oops, down to here. Okay, we get We have here is just this. This equals what? 7x plus 2x is 9x. And 2 minus 2 is 0. So we have 9x over x minus 1. 7x minus 7x is 0. 2 and 7 is 9. So that's 9x over x minus 1 divided by 9 over x minus 1. Of course, dividing by the fraction, we have 9x over x minus 1 times x minus 1 over 9. And that's the same as 9x over 9 times x minus 1 over x minus 1, which is 9x over 9 times 1, which is 9 over 9 times x over 1, which is x. And there's a lot of detail in that. But if you divide 9x by 9, you know you get x, right? And if you divide x minus 1 by x minus 1, you know you get x. So this is the reason you get x, but you can just kind of go directly to this. Okay. Now you also need to do f inverse of f of x equals x. So I'm going to write out the expression for this, but I'm not going to go through all the details. I'm just going to claim that it equals x, and then suggest to you that you might want to work that out to be sure you knew the outcome. So f of f inverse of x equals. So wait, I did f of f inverse of x, didn't I? Yeah. Or f inverse of f of x equals. Okay, well, f inverse is 7x plus 2 over x minus 1, right? It'll help if I just write out the f inverse function. F inverse of x is 7x plus 2 
verse 1. So, except in verse of F of X equals 7 F of X over F of X minus 1. Because X has been replaced by F of X, we replace all these X's plus 2 of them by F of X. Okay? And of course, now f of x, as we know from originally, uh, originally f of x was x plus 2 over x minus 7. That equals this. Okay. Now I will go, go ahead and write this out. But I'm going to skip some steps. From this point, well, from this point, you ought to be able to substitute and you'll need to be able to substitute in here and then do the algebra. Okay. Okay, so need a common denominator of x minus seven. So I'm going to have two times x minus seven over x minus seven. So right there is my two. Two times x minus seven divided by x minus seven is two. And the seven times x plus two over x minus seven. Well, two times. Okay. And then similar thing down here. Uh, the x minus negative x minus seven over x minus seven are are uh oh uh, are negative one. Okay, can't even use a mask for an excuse. I wasn't blocking my vision. Just looking in the right place. Okay, x minus seven over x minus seven is one. So the negative is going to give me negative one. There's my negative one. And x plus two over x minus seven is a distributive law, then these expressions are the same as these expressions. I'm just going to do the arithmetic. I'm going to have a seven x here and a two x here. That's nine x, right? That's going to give me nine x. I'm going to have 14, 7 times 2, but then negative 7 times 2. That's going to give me 0. So I'm going to have 9x over x minus 7 divided by, sorry about there, divided by x minus x is going to give me 0. A negative negative 7 is plus 7, so that's going to be 2 plus 7, which is 9 over x minus 7. Which is nine x over x minus seven times x minus seven over nine. I just inverted the denominator. I didn't bother writing it out with the division sign like I did up here. And this equals x. Because 9x divided by 9 is x, x minus 7 divided by x minus 7 is 1. Okay, that shows the have an inverse function. I'm going to give you one to work on. Okay. There's a little more to it. You know, you got to worry about domains. So that uh, your f of x function here. Is undefined if x equals seven, and your inverse function is undefined if x equals one. Think about the graphs of these things, maybe. maybe. Yep. No idea how that works. Let's just take this one. I'm going to give you just a little bit of a curveball here.
There's up of X, find out the inverse of X. As we did here, you see that you want to start writing y equals x plus q over x minus seven, like we did here, except you're going to use that function, right? And then you're going to switch the x's and the y's, and then you're going to do algebra. So I'll, I'll, I'll start it for you. Okay. I just say switch, etc. You switch the X and the Y, so then you solve for Y. Okay. So what do you get? That X equals 2Y plus 6 over Y minus 1. Then you multiply both sides by Y, which gives you X times Y minus 1. Two y plus six. Not writing out the specific stuff, and you get x y minus x equals two y plus six. You can rearrange that to get your y's on one side by subtracting the two y from both sides. You get rid of this x by adding it to both sides. You get this. Okay, so again. Yeah. I'll fill in the skip steps to make sure you understand what you're doing. You get down to this point and you factor out the block, just like before. You get this. Okay. I did it right. Do you agree? I must have done it right. I here. just flipped it though on the top where x plus six, but that was about it. Yeah. Instead of six plus x. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> you have the steps for that. That's good. So f inverse <laughs> of x is six plus x over x minus two. Now you check it and put them up in the time to do that. Okay. Well, that's how you do it. Okay. There was other stuff in the homework. Some of it deals with powers, even seventh powers or fifth powers. You might have trouble with that. And if you do, we'll look at it next time. But again, the process is always switch the X's and the Y's and solve for Y using standard algebraic operations.